Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. Are you familiar with the phrase, in the world but not of the world? Well, the, the phrase isn't actually found in the Bible, but the sentiment is found there in Luke, or Luke, in John chapter 17. And it comes from a prayer that Jesus made for his disciples following his last meal in the upper room. So John chapter 17, beginning with verse, verse 14, we read, Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Now, Jesus is, is praying that God would protect believers from the evil one and from the problems of the world. Jesus didn't pray that God would take us out of the world and, and from the problems and temptations that the world has, but that we live in the world, but not of the world. We're to be in the world, but not like the world. You know, think of a boat floating floating in the water. Now, while it's floating in the water, it's serving its purpose. It's floating. But if water starts getting into the boat, then it's starting to have a problem. You know, the boat and the purpose for the boat become compromised. And if, if too much water gets into the boat, what's the boat going to do? It's going to sink, right? And then it can't serve its purpose. We are to be in the world letting our light shine for God's glory, but we are not to be of the world or influenced by the world. You know, sometimes staying in the world while not becoming of the world can be a difficult balance. But this is what God has called us to do. He's, he's called us to be a light. And in order to be a light to the world, we have to be in it. But we can't be a light if we're living just like it. Now, we're continuing our story of Abraham's life, and we find a story where Abraham's nephew Lot had a difficulty living in the world without becoming a part of the world. Now, we're going to be in chapters 18 and 19 of Genesis, but I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to read the story, I'm going to tell the story. So you can follow along, but I'm going to tell the story this morning. It's a, it's a lot of verses. Also, before we get to that story, I want to make two observations that I think will help us understand this story. And the first observation is the importance of hospitality. Hospitality is important in the Middle East. It, it is today and it was then. Hospitality is emphasized throughout the the scriptures. You know, I mentioned last week there were no buckies. You know, there was no place where they could stop, water their camels, get something to eat, buy a new rug for their tent, right? All in one stop. Uh, there were no, no Hotel 8s, Motel 8s leaving their lights on for them. And so travelers were dependent on the hospitality of people they came across. They're traveling, they run into someone, they didn't know them, and yet they were dependent on them to provide hospitality, a place to stay, maybe even uh, some food while they were on their journey. And if you invited someone into your house, you became responsible for them. All right, so you were responsible to feed them, but you were also responsible for their protection while they were under your roof, under your tent. If, as long as they were with you, you were responsible. The second observation that I want to point out is how Lot is described in the New Testament. 
You know, Peter wrote about Lot, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, and it says, Lot, a righteous man who is distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Two verses and twice, Lot is referred to as being a righteous man. A man who felt oppressed by the wickedness that he saw and heard each day. All right, so our story begins in Genesis chapter 18. Abraham by now is 99 years old. His wife is is 89. They have been waiting 24 years for God to fulfill the promise of giving them a son. Last week we saw how they got tired of waiting and and decided, well, maybe we just need to take things into our own hands and, and we'll provide a son. And so Sarah suggested that Abraham take her servant, Hagar, and have a son uh, through, through the servant, Hagar. And this wasn't God's plan. But God was faithful to Abraham and Sarah and would still keep his promise to them by giving Abraham and Sarah a son. And so almost 25 years after God first spoke to Abraham and and made this promise of a son, God comes and he visits Abraham to renew this promise. And so one day, Abraham is just sitting there in front of his tent, and he sees these three men approaching. And we're going to learn as the story unfolds that these three men are, one was God, And two of the men were angels. And there's no reason to think Abraham recognized them as such. But he immediately gets up because that is the custom. He gets up and he bows down to the ground before them. And then showing the expected hospitality, he invites them in to rest. And he invites them in to eat. Now, when you're traveling... You're making a long trip. How long do you stop at a pit stop to rest, right? You got to get some gas, maybe go to the bathroom. How long do you usually stop, right? You want to get off the interstate, get back on as quickly as possible, you know, half hour at most, unless, unless you're eating a meal, right? Maybe an hour, but you're, you're trying to be, make it as quick as you can, right? Well, this invitation isn't going to be just for an hour or so. This invitation is going to be for much longer than that. In fact, cultural norms of that day said they could stay up to three days. Not three hours, three days with you. And then, you know, they're probably good to, to move on. And so listen to the preparations that Abraham is going to make. Abraham has Sarah go and get three seahs of flour to make some bread. It's only three seahs. That that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it's equivalent to about 26 pounds. 26 pounds of flour. How many loaves of bread can you make with 26 pounds of flour? And, And how long would it take to bake all of that bread? All right, and while she's baking, Abraham goes out into the pasture and has a servant select a calf. You talk about fresh meal. This is it. It was mooing when they got there. Right? Make fresh meal. And and so it's going to take a while to cook this meal. And while they're waiting for for the food to be prepared, God tells Abraham, by this time next year, Sarah, will have a son. Now, when Sarah hears that, she just, she laughs. What do you mean? In my old age, I am going to have a son? And when God called her out for laughing, she denied it, but God knew. God heard. Now, what makes that particularly interesting is that in the previous chapter, God uh, renewed this promise, and Abraham laughed. But there was a difference in the way they laughed. Abraham laughed because of joy. 
But Sarah here laughs out of doubt. She doesn't believe that in her old age, she could have a child. Now, the meal has been prepared, they've eaten the meal, and the men are getting up to leave, but God explains to Abraham what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. God was going to destroy the cities because of their grievous sins. Now, as God begins to explain to Abraham what's going to happen, his, his mind immediately goes to his nephew Lot. Lot was at Sodom. His wife, their daughters lived in Sodom. What would happen to Lot and his family if God destroys the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? And Abraham asks God, well, if you're going to destroy them, are you going to destroy the righteous along with the wicked? Because remember how Lot is described. He's described in the New Testament as being a righteous man. And God asked, would if, or Abraham asked if God would really wipe out the righteous with the unrighteous. And God listens to what Abraham has to say. And God says if he finds 50 righteous people, he will not destroy the city. And Abraham asked, well, well what if you're five short what if there's only 45 or maybe 40 or 30 or 20? And each time Abraham speaks, God listens and he agrees and he reduces the number needed. And then finally, Abraham speaks for one last time. What, what if God can only find 10 righteous people? Because Abraham knew there was, there was Lot, there, there was his wife, there were his two daughters, but that's only four. I mean, unless they've done some evangelizing, there, there's only going to be four. But God says, if he can find only ten, he will, he will save the city. So with that, Abraham walks back to his tent uh, the two men, the angels, continue on to Sodom, and it, and it appears then that God goes back to heaven. And so that evening, the two angels arrive in Sodom. And Lot is, is sitting at the city gate, and so he sees them approaching, and like his uncle Abraham, he goes out to greet them, and he shows them honor by bowing down before them. He, too, invites them to stay with them. He offers them a meal, a place to wash their feet, and a place to stay. Now the two men are appreciative of the hospitality, but they insist they'll be fine just staying uh, out in the city and uh, at the city square for the night. But Lot insists. No, no, you need to come in. You know, Lot hadn't just heard about the city's reputation as Abraham had. He had seen it. He's lived there. He knows up close. And so because of Lot's insistence, the men go with Lot to his home for the night. And after they eat and, and begin preparing to go to bed, there's a knock on the door. The men of the city want to see Lot's two visitors. Now today... There are some who try to explain away the actions of these men. Uh, they were just being unkind, rude. They, they weren't showing hospitality. But that's not what the Bible says. And most translations are very blunt when it comes to their actions. Now, in the Hebrew, in Hebrew, the, the word literally says... Uh, bring them out that we may know them. But when they ask to bring them out so they could know these two men, they're not saying, we just want to talk to them, you know, find out where they're from, where they're going. We just, we just want to get to know them better. That, that is not what they were saying. And if there's any doubt about the sexual nature of their intentions, all we have to do is look at Lot's response. 
After condemning their actions as, as being wicked, Lot offers them his two daughters. And then says that they have not known a man. Now, now we shudder at that thought. I mean, what? You're, you're going to give your two daughters? But it illustrates his commitment to hospitality and to protecting these two men who were under his roof. These two men who he didn't even know. Now, I don't want to go any further on this subject except to say that while some are calling homosexuality a, a gray issue about which, you know, we just can't be certain what the Bible says. We don't know, and so we shouldn't make any judgments. The Bible is quite clear. It's quite clear here. It's a sin. Now, was it the only sin that the people in Sodom were committing? Well, no. No, they committed other sins, and there are other sins pointed out later in the, in the Old Testament. However, this is the sin that's being highlighted in this passage, in this story. And when Lot denounces it, the men of Sodom are furious and accuse Lot of judging them. Who are you, a visitor, because he wasn't born there, who are you to judge us? A, a familiar tactic of those confronted with their own sins. When the men of Sodom try to break in Lot's door, the, the two men, the angels, strike the men of the city with blindness. Now it's been suggested that, that their blindness wasn't that they were completely blind, but that they were unable now to see the door. Right? They just couldn't find Lot's door. I heard about a, a practical joke at ETSU someone played uh, several years ago. Uh, a student went home every weekend, and so on Friday afternoon when he went home, uh, some of his neighbors, friends, other students anyway, we'll call them, uh, got some drywall, and they drywalled his door. They painted his door, sanded it all down so that you couldn't tell there was a, a door had ever been there. Put the molding down on the floor, right, to make it just blend in with the rest of the hall. And then when he came back on Sunday afternoon, he walks up to his room and there's no door. <laughs> there's just a long hall. <laughs> so he's got to knock down the hall until he finds, you know, it sounds a little bit different and then busts through. <laughs> the drywall to get into his room. Now that is a, that is a long plank you, uh, tr trick that you got to plan ahead of time, a prank, right? I mean, this isn't something you just pull off. You, you got to plan this ahead. That, that was pretty good. And so the men, the men are trying to get into Lot's door and, and they just can't even find it. They don't know how to find it. Now the two men tell Lot about God's plan. This is what God is going to do. He's going to destroy the city, and so you need to get out of here. Gather all of your family, all who are connected with your family, and you need to leave. And so Lot gathers his wife, his, his two daughters. We're told that his two daughters were engaged to be married. And, and so Lot went to tell his future sons-in-laws, but they just think he's joking. And so they refuse to leave. Before leaving... Lot and his family, the two men instruct him. He says, now go to, go to these mountains and don't look back. Now, of course, we know, we know what happens. They get a little distance from the city and, and Lot's wife looks back. She turns around, she looks back at Sodom and, and she turns into a, a pillar of salt. Now, that, that seems kind of like a harsh judgment, does it not? Just, just for glancing back? But I think there's more that's, that's going on here. You know, Jesus talked about those who put their hands to the plow and then looking back were not fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus, Jesus wasn't talking about having a peek back. He's talking about having a longing to go back. And I think that's part of what is happening here. Lot's wife looks back looks back at what she's leaving and desires that life that she's leaving. 
And so while four may have been delivered from the city, only three make it to safety. Now, we would wish that that was the end of the story. But it's not. You know, it was much easier to get Lot and his daughters out of Sodom than to get Sodom out of his daughters. Lot and his daughters settle in some nearby mountains where they live in a cave. And, and after a while, Lot's daughters become worried. They're concerned that they may not be able to find husbands. And if they don't have husbands, they can't have children. And so they come up with a plan. And on successive nights, they get their father drunk and they sleep with him. The older daughter gives birth to a son that she names Moab, and he becomes the father of the Moabites. Uh, the younger daughter gets pregnant. She has a son, and she names him Ben-Ami, and he becomes the father of the Ammonites. And both of these people, the Moabites and the Ammonites, are a thorn in the side of the Israelites as they travel from Egypt to the Promised Land. Now, this is a difficult story. It's difficult. It's difficult to hear because we don't like to hear about sin and, and God's judgment. It's hard to hear about people who make bad decisions and, and the trouble that it leads them to, especially when those bad decisions are made by people who trust God. You know, Lot moved to Sodom because he thought it would provide an easy life for him. Lot had traveled with his uncle Abraham for a number of years. He, he had seen how difficult it was in the wilderness to find enough grass to feed the flocks. And so when their herds became being too large that they needed to separate, and Abraham says, well, you go one way, I'll go the other. You pick which way you want to go. Lot looks out over the Jordan Valley. He, he sees how well watered it is. In fact, the Bible compared it to the Garden of Eden. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't choose that? And so that's what Lot chose. He, he chose to move toward Sodom. And he lived there. But when we catch up with Lot in Genesis 19, we're told that he was sitting at the city gate. Now, we might just pass right over that, not thinking too much of it. It's not that an important detail. But what we need to know is that all the business of the city was conducted at the city gate. When Boaz desired to purchase the land that had belonged to Ruth's deceased father-in-law, Boaz went to the city gate to talk to its leaders. A Job that talked about the time when he was a community leader and sat at the city gate. And so Lot was sitting at the city gate, tells us that Lot had become a recognized leader in the city of Sodom. At first, Lot had moved near Sodom in, in Genesis 13. In Genesis 14, we're told that he was now living in the city of Sodom, but now in chapter 19, he's one of their leaders. It sounds like he had gone from being in the city to being of the city. And this compromise that he made affected not only himself, but his wife and his two daughters, who were ready to marry men of the city. And so I want to ask us, how do we live in the world without becoming a part of the world? Because God calls us to live in the world, to be a light to the world, to be witnesses of Christ's love. How do we live in the world but not of it? And I, I think we have to make three decisions, three commitments. One is that we know God makes the rules, not society. God makes the commands. We follow his commands. Second, we stand for the truth regardless of what it costs. And third, we must not compromise. 
A preacher asked his congregation this very difficult question. How many legs does a dog have? How many? Four. Four legs. Four legs. And then he asked them, how many different paths can those legs follow? Well, just one, right? Each leg can't decide to go its own way. They got to go one path. One path. And then he asked, well, how many legs does a Christian have? And it's two. And he made the point. He said, the Christian with only two legs will try to walk two different paths, the path of following Christ and the path of following the world. We can't do that. We, we can't follow Christ and follow the world. We have to make a decision. Which are we going to make? Which are we going to follow because we can't follow the world and follow God. We can live in the world, but we are not to live like the world. One commentator noted, you may think that you are different from Lot, but if you have put your job ahead of your family's spiritual life, if you have put your social advancement ahead of a proper association with God's people, if you have let your choice of a home keep you from a church, in which you can grow in faith and worship, you have moved from the highlands to the plain of the Jordan. We could add other indications to this list. If you are focusing on life, on your life, on externals and not on your spiritual life, you're focusing on the wrong issues. If you, your focus is on attaining status rather than cultivating character, you're focusing on the wrong issues. If you're more concerned with, with, with something that costs what costs with what something costs monetarily instead of what it costs spiritually, you are focusing on the wrong issues. If you are focusing on what will be most enjoyable instead of what will be most beneficial you are focusing on the wrong issues. The, the world wants to influence us. You know that, right? I mean, all you have to do is drive down the road and see a billboard. It wants to influence you. All you have to do is turn on the TV and watch the advertisements. The world wants to, to influence you. I heard the CEO of Netflix say that he knows the shows they, they stream shape culture. And that they would continue to put these shows on until they shape culture the way they want the culture to look. Now, do you think that he's trying to get the culture to look like God? God's word. I, I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't think there are any major companies doing that. In fact, they all seem to be doing the opposite. I remember years ago, one media executive who said that every show he produced, he tried to push the envelope. And by that he meant he was trying to get away with whatever he could and not be censored. He was trying to change culture. And, and we know that culture has been changed. All we have to do is look around us. Our culture is not encouraging us to follow God. And so we have to make a conscious decision not to be like the world. We have to make a conscious decision to be like Jesus. We can't make compromises as Lot did. Because it will only bring difficulty and heartache. Our focus cannot be on the world. Our focus has to be on God. On God's word, because it's in God's word that we learn about God, what God is like, his, his grace, his patience, his mercy. It's in God's word that we read about God's love for us so that he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins that we might have forgiveness. It's in God's word that we read about how God would have us to live. His instructions, his commands. If we're going to live for God, to live in the world and not be of the world, then we have to focus on God. Our focus has to be on God and on God's word. This morning we're going to sing our invitation hymn, and, and we invite you to come. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, to give your life to him, we invite you to come. This morning, if, if you need prayer, if you need to, 
to return to Jesus, to return to God, we invite you to come. Won't you please stand? Won't you come as we sing?